podcast. I am Dr. Darren Wolf. I am a board certified forensic pathologist slash medical examiner, and I love to talk about forensics. And so that's why I'm here and you're here to presumably learn something about forensics. Now, this is the second episode of the first season, and what I'm going to talk about today was originally intended to be the first episode the initial episode to kind of give you uh, a an idea of where I'm going with this. Now, of course, we didn't do that for the first episode because of this very important case that occurred um, where we reviewed the autopsy report of George Floyd because there were a lot of misconceptions and a lot of misunderstandings about that autopsy report. So with that having been done in the first episode, we can now come back to uh, what was originally intended to open the season. Now, today's episode is called Of Corpses and Cadavers, and this is actually the first part uh, because I'm not going to be able to do all I want to do in, in one podcast episode. It would be too rushed and too crammed. So today, even though it's Of Corpses and Cadavers, we're actually going to talk about cadavers first, and then corpses will be talked about in the next one. And so I know you're thinking... Corpses and cadavers, this is a synonym, right? Um, what What is the difference? Uh, is there a difference? And, well, there are differences. Um, you know, it's a little bit of semantics. Um, for one, cadaver is generally the term used for a body uh, used for anatomical dissection, for learning, you know, medical students and and students in anthropology and, and other fields, um, you know, anatomy graduate students and things like that. Um, the cadaver is uh, very different in, in its substance from the corpse. Now, a cadaver is a corpse, but I don't feel like a corpse is a cadaver because a corpse uh, in, in my field is what I call the, the freshly dead or someone who hasn't been uh, embalmed or uh, sort of pickled in formalin or formaldehyde like a, a cadaver is. So I wanted to talk about these things because the cadaver itself has a very different substance, a di very different feel than the corpse. And my first experience with death um, would have been with the gross anatomy cadaver. I'll get to that a little bit more in, in a moment. But what I want to do is I want you to get a, an idea for what I call the substance of death, okay? So we always hear people say, oh, we're just meat and bones, right? There's just nothing other than just our physical uh, elements. And that is in some sense true. However, we are infused with nutrient-rich, warm blood pumping through our bodies. We are also animated by electrical energy um, through our nervous system. And this provides sensation and allows us to move. So, um, you know, I'm basically talking about the, not just the machinations of how we move and how we think, but the physical substance of the body. And so without the animation, then we're left with you know, what's left behind, the body itself, the corpse, the cadaver. Um, I call it the great machine. But the, the moment we die, the, the clock begins to tick. And after that last electrical impulse is sent by the brain, the process of decay starts. The heart stops, and the process of decay starts. And so there's a short window of time there when there's really not much visually different uh, between the living and the dead. If you were to look at a body that's freshly dead, you, you can't say that body is clearly dead, uh, other than it's, of course, not breathing. Um, and so in that short time, the body is either autopsied or sent to a funeral home usually for burial preparation, which may be cremation. Uh, or it may be embalming and burial, which is very typical, of course, in the Western world. And so this window of time before the body is sent for its final preparation is what I'm talking about. So 
I really like to differentiate between the corpse and the cadaver because it gives you the the two um, uh, elements or the two manifestations of what we see as uh, as doctors of the dead. And so, uh, starting with the cadaver, you know, I mean, I guess the first thing I, I think is uh, when was the first time you ever saw a dead body? Like, have you ever thought of that before? When was the first time you saw a dead body? I mean, for most of us uh, who who aren't uh, serial killers or or happen upon a a random body like in the movie Stand by Me, our first experience is typically at a funeral, right? Uh, that's when most people see their first dead body and uh, their first experience with death. Uh, but if, for me, uh, that actually was not the case. Um, I think that I had a, probably an unusual experience in that my whole life up until my first day of medical school, I actually had never seen a dead body. I'd never been around a dead body, um, which, uh, you know, that was about 25 years before I started medical school and did not have any experience with that. So my first, um, you know, dead body experience was the cadaver in the first day of medical school. And um, so this, this was unusual because, right, you know, you're 25 years old and uh, usually somebody you know dies of, uh, family member or friend, uh, and you go to the funeral, but I, I guess you could say I was lucky. I did not have, um, any close family members or friends die in that time frame. Um, I did have some family members die when I was very young, a uh, very young child. And, um, either I don't remember being at the funeral or I didn't go for whatever reason. But, um, as you can imagine, uh, when you are 25 years old and have never seen a dead body, there's a little bit of anxiety that's uh, associated with going to medical school and knowing that you're going to be dissecting a cadaver on the first day and that you might be the only person in the room who hasn't seen a dead body. And so naturally, uh, you have to wonder how you're going to react to that. Um, so at the moment I gained acceptance to medical school, you know, I opened my letter and it said that I was in, I, I started thinking about that very shortly thereafter is, um, I'm going to be dissecting a corpse and I need to, uh, I guess I should say cadaver, right? Because I, I made the distinction, but, um, I knew that I was going to be presented with this challenge, this rite of passage in medical school. And so one of the things I did uh, to kind of hope I could, you know, break the ice or, or diminish the anxiety in this situation was to see an autopsy. I, I wanted to reach out to my local hospital and pathologists and, and get signed up to come and, and see an autopsy. So um, I gave them a call and they agreed. They said, oh, yes, this is a great idea. You're going to be a medical student. You definitely want to see an autopsy. And so I put my name in and then, you know, weeks went by and I was very excited and nervous to go. And then weeks became months. And finally, August, uh, which is when we start medical school, arrived and I never got to see an autopsy. So I called the hospital and I said, well, you know, I, I really, really would like to see an autopsy. I just feel like I need to do this before I go dissect this uh, cadaver in medical school. And they in fact had no autopsies in that time. And, uh, this is a very surprising element for people is that, um, hospitals really aren't doing many autopsies nowadays. Um, and of course, consider this was 20 years ago when I was, uh, going into medical school, but, um, it's been like that for a while. And the truth is, um, hospitals don't regularly autopsy patients much anymore. Um, in 1972, uh, the government, uh, which used to use uh, autopsy performance as a quality control measure, they actually eliminated that requirement in 1972. So at that point, when hospitals didn't need to do them, of course, they stopped doing them because they 
uh, they take up a lot of time. And in fact, uh, it declined every year after that until the early 1990s, um, early to mid 1990s, it got down to about 5% of the people who died in a hospital got an autopsy. So in other words, out of every 100 hospital deaths, only five would get autopsied. And this always surprises people. Um, people who aren't in medicine think that autopsies are occur occurring a lot. And in fact, uh, they aren't. Um, now, the, I must distinguish hospital autopsies are not common. Forensic autopsies are quite common because any unnatural death is um, investigated, or, or I shouldn't say not just unnatural, but any kind of surprise death, uh, unexpected death, is investigated by forensic autopsy, which um, is not affiliated with the hospital, although sometimes they do occur in hospitals. So all those months went by, they didn't have one autopsy, and um, I wasn't able to experience that before my gross anatomy class. Of course, now, the other reason why pathologists in the hospitals weren't doing autopsies is they don't get paid for them um, anymore. I mean, maybe 50 years ago they did, but after that requirement was removed, there were no more hospital autopsies, uh, no more pathologists getting paid. And for those of you who have done autopsies, they're very laborious procedures. Um, you know, they might take uh, hours to complete if you're really thorough, and then you have hours and hours of medical records to review. And then you have tests um, such as microbiology or toxicology, looking at the tissues under the microscope. So you're putting in 10, 12 hours on every case and actually not getting paid anything. So uh, pathologists are sort of, hospital pathologists are sort of notorious for not wanting to do autopsies. And um, yeah, so I, that's always a, a surprise to people. Um, and they usually, hospital pathologists now, they just like to send them to the forensic, which would be me. And I was a hospital pathologist at one point, and I did a, a handful of autopsies in my hospital career, but of course now I, I do a lot of autopsies. Of course, you know, it wasn't always like that. In the first half of the 20th century, and before that, about uh, half of all people dying in the hospital got an autopsy. So, you know, around 50%. And uh, earlier than that, you know, you go back through the 1940s and the 1930s, the numbers were even higher, you know, 70, 80 percent. Medical students were required to perform autopsies and all doctors would attend their autopsies. Um, I even I remember talking to a dermatologist once and he said that he had um, performed autopsies in medical school and that his father, who was also a doctor and a dermatologist, had performed autopsies. So that's kind of wild uh, to think about a dermatologist doing an autopsy. Uh, no respect to dermatologists, um, but it's just a, a kind of an unusual um, thought because now it is it is solely the realm of the pathologist and really just the forensic pathologist at this point. Although hospital autopsies are performed by at med more at med centers than at community hospitals, and so uh, because now. I said uh, prior to this, I wasn't going to do a lot of history. That's what I said in the first episode. But in this part where we're talking about cadavers, we're going to do a little bit of history. And so, as I said, earlier in medical education, there was a lot of um, interest in having medical students perform, um, you know, autopsies or cadaver dissections and things like that. And so these bodies were actually a very high commodity. They were a very valuable commodity for medical schools back through the early 1900s and through the 1800s and even the early 1800s. Um, the, the bodies were, were hard to come by. And so um, this is the, the historical portion that I'm going to tell you about. And I know many people listening to this will know this story, but not everybody has a background in medicine or pathology or um, history, medical history. But this is the really brief story of two guys named Burke and Hare, okay? Um, these guys were uh, in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And this is a story that's been told many times. It's been written about uh, in books, lots of book chapters. And so we're going to go back to 1828 in Edinburgh, 
Scotland. There was a guy named William Burke and William Hare. Well, at the time, there was a shortage of legally obtainable cadavers, okay? Scottish law at the time said that you could only dissect at a medical school. You could only dissect people who had died in prison, people had do, who had died by suicide, and orphans. So, you know, if you think about that, you know, you're not going to have someone dying every day in a prison. Um, maybe you might have somebody dying by suicide every day. Uh, but then you have to hope that they're found before they decompose and because a decomposed body is not that useful for dissection for medical school uh, because the anatomy, of course, as it decays, it becomes uh, um, unreal compared to what you need to know as a, as a physician, as a surgeon. And then orphans, of course, was the third category. So um, because there weren't enough cadavers, they were worth a lot. And uh, you have to consider that embalming hadn't really been invented yet. Um, sometimes they would uh, submerge the body in alcohol, like whiskey, um, to, to keep it preserved. But of course, that's a lot of whiskey, depending on the size of the person, of course. But um, in the 1820s, uh, you know, uh, you, you didn't have embalming, and so someone dies, and then the clock starts ticking, and the decomposition clock, and a body that's liquefying is again not useful for dissection. So fresh bodies were were uh, a very premium thing. Well, that's where Burke and Hare came in. Now uh, these guys uh, were uh, they had they had a guy uh, die basically uh, in their presence, like in in one of their uh, apartments, and so. They didn't quite know what to do with the body, so they took it to the medical school and they ended up getting a lot of money for it. And then I guess the light bulb went off and uh, these guys said, well, why, why would we go dig up bodies? Because, you know, at the time, grave robbing was, was a thing. People would go into the cemetery, they would dig up bodies, and they would um, steal jewelry off of them or sometimes they would try to, to send them for anatomical dissection. So much so that um, families would sometimes put a big concrete slab on top of the grave uh, for a certain period of time to kind of ensure that the body would be decomposing and therefore not be worth anything to um, a dissector. And then they would remove the slab. Or sometimes they would have um, watchmen, uh, like in a watchtower in the cemetery, to make sure people weren't stealing bodies. So Burke and Hare decided to just cut out the middleman and say, well, instead of waiting for people to die, why don't we just kill them? Yes, that's exactly what they did. They decided to kill them. So um, they kind of killed people in the same way each time. Um, basically, it involved alcohol. So they would invite people over or a person over. They would get them very drunk to the point where they could not... Um, they just, you know, were in a stupor, basically. And then at that point, um, when they're in a stupor, a person's in a stupor, you know, you can just knock them over. And then um, they would sit on their chest. And if you read the histories, it'll say that um, they were suffocated uh, by sitting on the chest. But, you know, I'm very um, much a, a nitpicky on forensic terminology. And suffocation in forensics is different, okay, than suffocation is it's kind of the deprivation of oxygen containing air okay so an example of suffocation would be someone who puts a bag around their head and maybe puts tape or ties it um, this is a common way that I see uh, every year I see a few suicides like this put a bag around the head and basically what happens is you just normally respirate so inside the bag there's oxygen you breathe it in and each breath, you're consuming oxygen and you're exhaling carbon dioxide. So as time goes on, a few minutes go by and you've exhausted the oxygen and you've expelled the CO2 and the carbon dioxide is CO2 and then you simply die. That is um, deprivation of oxygen. So that's an example of suffocation. And then another example is putting a pillow or a blanket or something over the mouth or the nose and uh, just limiting the amount of air that can come in. Now, keep in mind, we're not talking about 
uh, crushing the chest there. We're, we're really just breathing it in and um, we're breathing air that doesn't contain oxygen. So what Burke did, Burke and Hare, is they restricted the physical means of breathing. Now, that's what we talked about in episode one, right? Mechanical asphyxia and or some people call it traumatic asphyxia. And so they have these people who are already in a stupor from alcohol and then they sit on the chest and then that's it. They can't breathe. It physically restricts their breathing. And so, you know, I always like to tie in. You'll notice as I do these episodes, I always like to make a tie in from the previous episode. So there'll be like a chain all the way through the seasons. Well, in episode one, we talked about the autopsy of George Floyd. And although the primary mechanism was probably compression of the neck, there was also reports of um, uh, people, uh, other police officers who were kneeling on the body, possibly restricting breathing due to compression of the thorax um, or even the abdomen. And so this would have been uh, kind of similar to what Burke and Hare were doing. Now, this, believe it or not, is actually a forensic term called burking, B-U-R-K-I-N-G, referring to sitting on someone's chest or sitting, uh, putting a heavy weight on their body so that they can't breathe. And so, um, you know, it, this whole thing was, was crazy. They killed um, 16 or 18 people in that time. Uh, and they would just sell the bodies, get them drunk, sit on their chest, Suff, you know, not suffocate, but mechanically asphyxiate them, sell their bodies. Now, of course, uh, this is kind of interesting that they thought to do this, right? Because as I said in the first episode, you would not see the classic features of compressional asphyxia with that kind of weight. Usually you see petechiae and things like that, uh, burst blood vessels and congestion of the head and neck and things like that with very heavy weights. And the example I gave was a, a mechanic underneath a vehicle and the jack um, breaks and then the car falls on him. Uh, in the case of burking, you would be able to actually kill the person and there would be no evidence that that person was murdered. They would just uh, say, oh, we found this person drunk or we found this person deceased. And so then the person working at the medical school, the, um, the surgeon who was kind of the director of the anatomy, he kind of just didn't ask questions about it. He said, oh, okay, great, a body. Here's your money, and then we're going to use these for dissection. So uh, fortunately today, that's not the way it goes. Um, today, of course, people donate their body to science. That's what they always say. Um, they donate their body to science. It's a very altruistic thing to do. There's no killing or grave robbing involved. And ultimately involves the uh, most sacred right, I think, um, if you want to use that term, of the medical student, which is uh, being able to have this um, body donated by the person and their own goodwill for us to dissect and learn. And um, it's kind of amazing. It's a little bit of a surreal experience. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I love etymology. And um, you know, so let's talk about the etymology of cadaver, okay? This derives from the, a Latin word, cadere, which actually means to fall or to perish or to die. And so obviously, you know, death, we all fall, we all perish. And the cadaver is um, the term that has been accepted to use for just for anatomical dissection. Uh, corpse is different. Um, you know, corpse is, of course, any dead body, but it's, to me, it's the unfixed, the untreated body. Um, so technically, both in terms of anatomical dissection and doing an autopsy, technically both of them are autopsies in different ways. Um, the goal of the, cat the cadaveric dissection uh, is purely academic. It's purely to, you know, imbue our minds with anatomical knowledge and to learn, you know, in greatest detail, every visible structure in the human body. Whereas um, the autopsy otherwise is just to look for the cause and manner of death, 
Um, and again, we'll get into cause and manner and we'll go through all that stuff in future episodes. Um, but you know, back to the story, I just wanted to put the historical element in. I don't always do that, but in this case, it's such an interesting story. I had to tell it now back to my discomfort with being, uh, for a dead body free life until age 25. Of course, I never got to do that autopsy. And, uh, you know, I find myself starting medical school. I'm on the first day of medical school in the anatomy lecture. Um, I mean, technically, I think it was the second day, but we were in anatomy lecture. And you knew that after that lecture, it was time to go to gross anatomy and dissect. And um, it was a little nerve wracking, honestly. Um, there was a lot of nervous energy in the room, not just from me, but from other people. And then there was this rumor, and there's always rumors. When you're in medical school, there's always rumors. There's always a little bit of hazing. But there was rumors about someone every year um, faints during the gross dissection, uh, the gross anatomy dissection. So that made everything worse. And uh, even one of the senior anatomy professors was sort of laughing about it. Um, you know, yes, there's this thing about people who, you know, at least one person every year uh, faints during the gross anatomy lab. And so we're looking around the room and there's a, approximately 30 of us in my class. And I think if we were all thinking, well, who's it going to be? Which one of us is going down? And so, you know, <laughs> you can imagine the anxiety that was uh, kind of rising in all of us. So we finished the anatomy lecture and changed into our dissection clothes. Um, you know, you picture scrubs like surgeons wear, but really we were just wearing clothes that you would wear in gym class in high school. We weren't cool enough for scrubs yet. And so, you know, it just had this kind of surreal moment of being, you know, you're going to produce, you know, you're going to um, be involved in this sacred rite of medicine. And so we're all herded like cattle outside the gross anatomy door. Door finally opens. We walk in and immediately the sight is of these eight like steel coffin looking structures. And, and they are shaped like coffins because they, you know, contain a human body. And really what they are is like a special kind of stainless steel dissection table. And, um, but it, it was, it was just so surreal to be in this small room, very small room actually, with what you know contains eight dead bodies. Um, and so we, we all kind of herded around the tables randomly, three or four of us. And we just kind of waited for the professor to give us instructions to start, fold open the table, and then there's the black body bag. The black body bag, which you can tell is distended by a human body. Um, so a little unnerving because, you know, this is what they call the first patient. Um, the Gross anatomy cadaver in medical school is what's considered the medical student's first patient. They build that to us a lot. Now, as, a, as an aside, I know a lot of medical schools aren't even doing gross anatomy dissection now. They're doing it as a virtual. They're doing it on, you know, iPads, and they're doing it on um, people who have had, um, you know, full body um, cuts of their body, like an MRI almost, and they review the levels of that. Um, I'm not going to issue my opinion on whether or not I think that's a good idea. Uh, I just know I'm grateful that I got to do this with an actual uh, human body and not um, a computer. But so here we are standing around this and everyone just kind of has their eyes bugged out and you can just feel the nervous energy. And before we knew it, it was time to open the bag, start to open the bag, zip it open. And then this arm just kind of it doesn't flop out because you have to consider that these uh, cadavers are very stiff, but the arm just kind of comes out and it's at an angle. It's like this thin angular arm. It's very cold. There's this icy red liquid kind of pouring out of the bag, um, which wasn't blood. It was more, well, I guess it was kind of blood mixed with the formaldehyde. And it was just a very unusual experience because you don't see the head, you don't see the face, and there's just this arm. And then all of a sudden you realize, this is real. This is, we are in this now. There is no turning back. 
And so, um, you know, just as uh, kind of like the what leads to this moment uh, with the cadaver, uh, of course, there's I know many of you have probably read that book called Stiff um, by a, a lady named Mary Roach. Um, that is a very good book about gross anatomy. Um, and so, you know, I'm not going to go through all of the elements of how these cadavers come to be, but in short, uh, before they come to us, they are submerged in a formalin or that's a formaldehyde solution. So that's formaldehyde and water together to make a dilute solution called formalin. And so what happens is, is that body, which in my case, the body had already been embalmed. Um, some of them had been embalmed, some of them hadn't been embalmed, but either way, it's the same effect. So what happens is, is formalin, which contains the formaldehyde chemical, um, it actually makes the body easier to cut. And we use that same chemical in the pathology lab. So if we get a tissue from a body, let's say a little piece of liver, a little piece of breast tissue, we can put that in formal formalin or formaldehyde solution and it will firm it up. It actually makes it firm. And it does this because formalin uh, cross links. So it kind of uh, etches the proteins together in the body and it attaches um, at the site of certain amino acids, um, namely lysine, but there are other amino acids. And what happens is when it, when all these proteins start to link together, it preserves it. And so the, the cadaver itself becomes very stiff. It's not soft. Now the fresh, freshly dead corpse is, is soft and then it becomes firm. It becomes firm because of rigor mortis. And believe me, we're going to talk on this podcast, um, not today, but in the future, we're going to talk about the, the, uh, changes that occur after death, um, the timing of them, the decomposition, but rigor mortis sets in, in a freshly dead corpse. And, uh, it's the same, it's the same idea. Proteins, uh, kind of link, uh, they kind of cross link in the, uh, the muscle tissue. And they become very firm. The difference, though, in a corpse, in a person who is dead and not embalmed or submerged in formalin, or whiskey for that matter, is that the rigor mortis actually goes away after a few days and the body becomes very um, floppy and soft again. And with a cadaver, they never become soft again. They're stiff forever or until we're done dissecting them. And so um, this, uh, this man, we knew he had been embalmed because he had the incisions at his um, groin, uh, the femoral area. They actually insert into the femoral vessels. They insert the, uh, you know, the trocar and they, they add the, the embalming fluid and he had stitches there. So we knew he had been embalmed. And so um, you know, we removed the bag and there he is. We can see his face now. And his arms are stretched across his abdomen. And you could tell it was in a position that was consistent with his funeral position. Kind of that, um, you know, head forward and the, the hands across the abdomen kind of uh, clasped together. It was really a surreal thing. Um, he was quite thin. He was tall. You could tell he was very tall. His abdomen was sunken in. His cheeks were sunken in. And even at the sides of his head sunken in. That's something we call temporal wasting. Temporal referring to the temples, the side of the head. So when temporal wasting sets in, we know that this is a sign of malnutrition, kind of like, um, or wasting like we see in terminal diseases like cancer. And so I know you've all probably seen uh, patients or, or maybe unfortunately loved ones who have had terminal wasting from a, a chronic disease or even old age. And if you get to your 90s or 100s, you, you're going to have wasting of your fatty tissue as it is. But uh, this man was as stiff as a board. And, you know, he was a gray tan color head to toe. And this was going to be the subject of my attention and the attention of everyone in the class for the next nine months of medical school. And we dissect... Uh, every single nerve fiber, every muscle, every blood vessel. And, uh, you know, that was our goal. We knew that this was going to be our, our patient that we were going to learn from. Now, the good news is everybody got their body out and nobody had fainted. So we all looked around the room. It was still very serious. It was one of the only times during my first year of medical school that everyone was pretty darn serious. 
because otherwise uh, there was at least some joking around now and then once the ice was broken with the body, but that first day was very serious. And uh, as we looked around, you know, everybody had that same kind of gray tan uh, corpse uh, look to it. Um, you know, and they were thin, they were obese, some were men, some were women, some were very old people, some were middle-aged people. Uh, my particular cadaver was uh, an 80-something-year-old man, and um, he, he was a, a white male, and he had, uh, they had a little card which would give his uh, name, or not his name, but it would give his age and what he died from. And my cadaver actually had died from uh, complications of what's called chronic myelogenous leukemia. Now, chronic myelogenous leukemia is not typically a disease that will kill someone, but as, at his old age, uh, it probably had, um, you know, advanced to an acute leukemia. And acute leukemias in older folks can can rapidly kill people. And so... He looked quite wasted away, partly from age and partly from, you know, uh, his disease, his, his uh, cancer of his blood. And so, but at this point, now this is what's interesting. I expected we would start cutting and we would get on with it. But in fact, no scalpels would be used on the first day. Um, the, the ritual at my school, which was the Indiana University School of Medicine, um, is that we were instructed to wash the body with soap and water and then shave all the hair off. Now, this is, this is an odd experience, right? I mean, to have to wash somebody else's body and to shave somebody else's body, it's, it's almost like a ritualistic, almost like a religious-type ritual. But the idea was to gain comfort with the body, to, to have a tactile or physical touch of the body over a period of a couple of hours of washing away all of this debris that was in the body bag because, you know, you have all these sloughed off skin cells, you have um, respiratory material or even material from inside the stomach. Uh, if it was in there coming out during the moving of the body, you had um, blood that had been, what blood was left over uh, after the embalming process would have been clotted. And then the clotted blood kind of becomes um, grainy and crumbly. And so this was all over the body. We, we all together washed this body head to toe. We touched every square inch, every square centimeter. And it really did make you feel acclimated to the body. Now, the shaving I was not cool with. Um, I don't know. I just felt a little weird uh, trying to shave a body. But we did. We shaved the body. And uh, between the washing and the shaving, it was completely, um, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was an experience that kind of bonded all the people at the table. But at the same time, we now became pretty um, comfortable with, with this particular cadaver and, and ready to, you know, dissect. And so this, this was kind of what I get when I talk about the substance of death. I mean, you could feel how firm his tissues were. And you could feel uh, how cold he was. Um, it wasn't just room temperature. He felt cold. And it was an undeniably odd sensation. Um, the skin, uh, with his arms flexed, we had to actually do what's called breaking down of the Riger. So we had to move his arms, really, you know, the really stiff arms, move them down to his side. In the freshly dead, the skin is supple. The color can be very similar to that in life. And, uh, but in the cadaver, we were talking uniform gray tan color, no vibrant colors like you see in the, in the corpse, the freshly dead, the reds and the blues and the yellows that you see and all the other many colors you can see inside the human body. But, you know, this, this way that we dissect, uh, the cadaver is, is like I said, it is a kind of autopsy, but it's different now. When we talk about etymology of the word autopsy, it means to see for oneself, right? So ought means self and op, O-P, means to see. So to see for oneself. And as learners, that's what we were doing. We were looking inside to see the machinations of this human body and, and learning about every single thing that puts it together. 
So a standard autopsy might take something like, you know, if you think about a drug overdose or a car accident, it might take an hour, but an anatomical dissection of a cadaver takes months. We started in August and we didn't finish until the end of March. Um, and, you know, the reason for that is because when we perform an autopsy, we're not studying every anatomical structure head to toe. We're studying the anatomy, but we're also looking specifically for diseases, pathologies of the body organs. We're not going to study every nerve in the neck or every single structure in the brain. Um, So, you know, in a cadaver dissection in medical school, you might spend two weeks on the nerves and muscles of the arms. Whereas in an autopsy, you do not need to dissect the arm at all. Uh, You know, you have a guy who comes in, maybe he collapsed at work. You don't need to dissect the arm. You know that's probably going to be a cardiac or a cardiopulmonary case, uh, possibly a brain-related case. Now, you do have to dissect an autopsy um, uh, limbs and other various structures. If you're looking for something that had been injured, for instance, a gunshot wound to the arm, I will dissect the arm, and I will see what it broke or what what it injured. But... Um, decidedly different experience, uh, a much more um, involved experience um, head to toe with the the cadaver dissection. Now, all this being said, we did the first day, we came back the second time, and it was time for the first cut. And the first cut, you know, that is where you really understand the substance of death of the cadaver. Uh, I felt that I needed to cut this body to overcome my apprehension and fears. I wanted to be the first one in my group to grab the scalpel and go. And, um, you know, there we were kind of standing there. There was a tray, a surgical tray of scalpels. And, you know, it it's just uh, the scalpel looked like it had been used in the 1800s. It was like an old wooden scalpel with a blade attached to it. And um, the body itself, having been washed and shaved, We had wrapped gauze around all the areas we weren't dissecting. So the limbs and the head were wrapped in gauze. It was a very um, impersonal type uh, procedure. But I just felt like this was like ripping a Band-Aid off. You know, you rip it off quickly and you get it over with versus pulling it slowly and suffering with every single bit of pain. I grabbed the scalpel and my knife hovered above the skin of the back and I just kind of waited for the professor to say go and my knife is sitting there parallel and finally she said go and I dropped the blade plunged it right into the skin without hesitation but oddly it did not make a sound it was a uh, it was silent and and I pulled the scalpel in my opening incision along the midline of the back because we were starting to dissect the midline of the back um, to look at the muscles of the back and, and of the the back of the neck was where we started in my dissection at my medical school. And, you know, the fact that it didn't make any sound at all, there was no recoil of the skin like you see with a fresh corpse. It was just gray and leathery. And as I pulled the knife through, it was left with just a sharp edge slit where the scalpel had had passed through. And like I said, the silence of that cut was maybe unexpected. Um, the the material of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis and the subcutaneous fat, it had a consistency almost like a very sharp knife cutting through a soft cheese. Just no sound at all, and it just kind of split open. It was uh, a really surreal experience, and I looked around, and once again, no one had fainted. So we were just kind of um, hoaxed a little bit with another urban legend of medical school lore. And so um, at that point, you know, things got going. We were really hitting the ground running. We each took turns cutting this body, um, getting comfortable with it, and, you know, proceeded over months. Usually we would do one to two people dissecting at one time, while the other two people stood there with a lab manual and went through uh, kind of guiding us, you know, with various... uh, um, help on, you know, this nerve is next to this blood vessel and be careful not to cut it and sort of coaching us. And so we would switch back and forth. But overall, you know, the thing is no small task. I mean, we're looking through every organ, every single muscle, every blood vessel and its associated branches, 
every nerve and its associated branches. And the, everything in the cadaver appears to be a shade of gray tan. And, you know, uh, it's very boring looking uh, because you don't get to see those colors. But, you know, for the morbidly curious, it's uh, almost like an incredible Easter egg hunt because you're looking for a very, you know, a, a certain nerve or a certain uh, a blood vessel. And when you find it, it, you have that eureka moment. And, um, you know, I think with, with understanding the substance of death with the cadaver is that firmness, that uniformity of color, and uh, the dissection process itself so different because with the, ca- with the cadaver, we take it completely apart. And I mean, we saw the pelvis in half. We disarticulated the limbs. We took off the top of the skull and removed the brain to send for neuroanatomy. And then at some point, we finally sawed the head completely in half. And this is uh, far greater than what we do at autopsy. At autopsy, we do, um, you know, we do get inside the head. We do get inside the body cavities. But we don't um, cut the body in such a way that um, it um, distorts the body. We try not to distort the body because, remember, we're seeing it as forensic pathologists and autopsy pathologists. We're seeing the body before it goes for a funeral. And a lot of people, you know, we're in the Western world here. Almost everybody has a funeral. And so we want to uh, do that procedure of autopsy and then make it look like the body has never been cut. And there are ways to do that. And again, I'm going to talk about the autopsy procedure itself, um, mostly in, in the uh, throughout, but, but in the next podcast, we're going to talk about the corpse dissection or the autopsy. Uh, but in this case, uh, you know, we, we weren't just making the limited amount of cuts that we make with autopsy. We were taking the body apart and it's, uh, it's, it's, it assaults the senses, all of the senses, because, you know, you have to use saws, electric saws, and there's lots of dust, bone dust that smells like singed hair. Um, there's always that smell of cleaning chemicals as we try to sterilize everything and that ever present smell of formaldehyde. And so uh, this uh, procedure is uh, it certainly was a, was a humbling procedure for me to take nine months and take a human body uh, from an intact uh, human male and reduce him literally to two buckets, two five-gallon buckets of tissue. And that is exactly what happened. You, you go through and you dissect out every single little piece. And every piece you remove, you put it into a five-gallon bucket, and that is saved. Even, even the rinsings from the table will go into those buckets because eventually... Uh, this material will be cremated and um, and or buried. And so you can't just treat it like it's trash. You can't just cut a piece of tissue out and throw it in the garbage and move on. We try to be as respectful as we can um, when we do uh, anatomical dissection, not only uh, with the cadaver, but with the autopsy. We have to, uh, uh, as I said earlier, we if we really are just meat and bones, then then what value do we have? But we, in a sense, um, as I said, we, we were animated at one point, and we have to carry that uh, from the point of the last breath to the grave. And so we try to be as respectful as we can. And so with that, um, I think I've uh, spoken enough on this particular issue with the cadaver, um, as always, um, most people know how to reach me um, um, at Instagram, Anatomy in the Dead. And uh, also, I have a Knife After Death page on Facebook. And um, eventually, we'll be getting a website and uh, email address for you to um, direct your questions to. Because what I would like to do is if there's any major misconceptions or things that people think I left out or got wrong, I'd like to address those at the beginning of each podcast as we go along, um, you know, as we go forward. Again, this is, I'm still in kind of a testing phase where we're going to see what works and what doesn't work, but I hope you enjoyed this part one of Corpses and Cadavers where we talked about the uh, cadaveric dissection. 
next time when we speak, uh, when you listen to me speak, it'll be about my first autopsy, my very first autopsy, um, which I did when I was a, a resident, a first year resident in pathology. And that is a completely different sensation experience, uh, a completely different um, uh, concept of what I call the substance of death. So with that said, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, please uh, tell your friends and tell your family about this podcast and come back and listen to episode three, which will be part two of Up Corpses and Cadavers. Thank you.